Okay, so we've started recording, and again, thanks everyone for joining us today for our webinar, Promising Practices for Evaluating Nursing Home Owners. A little bit about the organization, uh, for those of you who are not familiar with us, the Long-Term Care Community Coalition, we are a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization entirely dedicated to improving care and quality of life for residents in nursing homes and assisted living other um, residential care facilities. We do policy analysis and systems advocacy, uh, both in New York State and nationwide, or nationally, I should say. Uh, we do more and more education of consumers and families, long-term care ombudsmen, um, and I'm really glad, appreciate you all being part of this. I think it's been a really important part of our work over the last uh, five to 10 years to be reaching out and engaging to the extent we can families uh, and residents and ombudsmen. And then lastly, we are home to the local long-term care ombudsman program for the Hudson Valley. We're actually now, as of this month, home to two local long-term care ombudsman programs for um, in New York State, one in um, uh, Lower Hudson Valley and the second in the Upper Hudson Valley. So um, welcome to, uh, to our ombudsman and welcome to our ombudsman, of course, outside of of LTCCC. So today um, I'll be speaking and then Eric Goldwyn, I'll go on, excuse me, we'll, our policy fellow will be speaking as well about COVID-19 and then we're going to hand it over to Dara Vallanajad, our now former policy counsel. We're going to say goodbye to Dara today. We actually said goodbye to Dara on Friday. Dara is leaving to uh, go work for the federal government, and we wish, of course, we wish him well. Uh, but Dara is going to be doing most of the talking today. He did most of the research on this uh, really, really valuable report. As I mentioned before we got started, uh, for those of you who just joined us at one, this material is on our website under LTCCC reports. There is a report. There's actually a chart of some promising state practices that Dara put together. Uh, with the Eric and my, and my help, and uh, so all that material is there, and I hope that it'll be useful for people in the um, months and years to come, especially once we hopefully get through this um, through the pandemic. We're going to leave time for Q&A at the end. If possible, you can type in your questions. If not, excuse me, you can unmute yourself uh, at the end of the program by pressing star six. Uh, a little bit about what we're gonna be talking about today. First, as I mentioned before, Eric is gonna give a coronavirus update, and then Dara is gonna talk about our report, some of the background, why we decided to do, um, do this study, and then some of what we found, both in terms of uh, what goes on at the federal level and then at the state level, and then some uh, promising practices that we identified in different states. And then I'll be talking at the end about just some of the essential principles that, that we have uh, identified that we think are important for anyone who is being evaluated or for the evaluation of anyone for a, um, uh, to own a nursing home, which of course is, um, uh, is very important, uh, needless to say, but also that it, uh, you know, we really need to, from our perspective, be looking carefully at um, the viability of the nursing home owner in respect to being able to provide services and care in an appropriate manner in accordance with federal and state minimum standards for residents every day. Uh, just a quick note here, as you can see on the side, if you're looking at the slides, uh, the report did not examine whether states are, are actually or adequately enforcing their licensing requirements. So what we did was you know, we looked to see what are states doing, what is actually out there, what kind of practices are out there in terms of evaluating someone who wants to buy a nursing home. We did not, as, a, as I'm saying here, we did not look to see, it was really beyond the scope of our work, unfortunately, to see how well they are actually implementing those requirements. Although we do, as Dara will talk about, um, we did get some feedback from a couple of states um, that were very kind to review our findings and provide us some really useful feedback about how those rules were being implemented in their states. Eric, I'm going to turn it over to you. 
All right. Thank you, Richard. And uh, sure. so before passing off to Dara, I'm just going to spend a few minutes uh, discussing LTCCC's coronavirus resources, uh, which are all the more important. As you know, uh, coronavirus has had devastating effects on nursing home residents. I think the latest count is it's claimed at least 6,900 lives and affected so many more. Um, so first, uh, this morning we published mm -hmm data on provider info for all U.S. nursing homes. And we separated this information into individual state files, which you can access by, uh, when you get to the page, you'll see, but you can click on a map, uh, you'll see on the bottom left uh, on our website and hover your mouse over a given state, and that'll allow you to access a state's file. Uh, these data, which were obtained from Nursing Home Compare, include General, general information such as location and ownership type, as well as performance indicators such as five-star ratings, uh, health inspection outcomes, and substantiated complaints. Uh, these can help you ferret out the facts on facilities that you may be working with directly or reading about in news stories or are just generally interested in learning more about. Um, relatedly, we also a few weeks ago published an infection control data set using nursing home compare data, and this allows you to view deficiencies, a scope, severity code, and other data for nursing homes you might be interested in. Uh, can you go to the next slide, please? Sure. So these aforementioned data sets can be found on our coronavirus resource page, uh, which you can see on the link on the top left, uh, nursinghome411.org slash coronavirus. And these will we'll continue to be updating these materials. Uh, in particular on this page, I'm sorry, the font is a little small on the right. Um, but I, in particular, I strongly recommend reviewing our infection control issue alert and our fact sheets in addition to our new data sets. Uh, uh, we've also recently launched a Nursing Home 411 podcast. Uh, these are 30-minute uh, uh, audio recordings uh, featuring interviews with uh, long-term care experts, both inside and outside of LTCCC. Um, on one of the recent episodes, uh, I spoke to Richard and Dara uh, about infection control issues and how they relate to coronavirus. And also, we, we had a conversation about visitation restriction. Uh, we've also had other guests, including a journalist, uh, Margie Lundstrom, to talk about food safety, uh, Jeanette Sandor to talk about defensive documentation, and uh, Deborah Trahowski, who offered tips on uh, detecting abuse and neglect, which is all the more important in these times. Uh, and you can find these episodes on our website, as well as on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Uh, lastly, uh, before I pass over to Dara, uh, LTCCC's advocacy has recently been featured by numerous media publications across different platforms. Uh, just yesterday, Richard uh, appeared on WNYC's Brian Lehrer show where he chatted with several callers who shared troubling stories about their family members in nursing homes. Uh, LTCC has also appeared in Law 360, New York Times, and so many other local and national publications, and I strongly recommend you read those, share those, and and yes, yeah, so, so I'm going to pass it over to Dara. Thank you for your time here. Thanks, Eric. Thank you, uh, Eric and Richard. Um, so I'll be talking about the report, as Richard mentioned. Um, can you go to the next slide, please, Richard? Thanks. Uh, so this report is about owners, nursing home owners, uh, and nursing home ownership. Um, and just to give you all a background, um, We've been seeing that nursing home residents are increasingly at risk of um, experiencing poor care due to problems in nursing home management, ownership, and uh, financial arrangements. And really, over the last few years, we've seen owners uh, increasingly leveraging and directing assets um, away from care and, and to um, profits uh, without any sort of real meaningful um, accountability for, for nursing home quality and safety. And really, the, the two prime examples, uh, most recent examples, 
are uh, Skyline Healthcare and HCR Banner Care. Um, and it, uh, can you go to the next slide, Richard? Thank you. Um, and um, just a background on Skyline Healthcare. There was a dramatic uh, real collapse of Skyline Healthcare um, in 2018, but first in 2015, um, it's when the facility, the chain, start, started purchasing uh, facilities across the country. Um, and by 2017, Skyline was operating more than 100 facilities nationwide. Um, and just as quickly in 2018, uh, sadly, um, it started to collapse as uh, many facilities ran out of money and others were shut down over neglect, um, as documented in government records. And in that little orange blurb we have um uh just a just a quote of a condition at one facility um reported by nbc news um so it says staff were told that disposable briefs would be rationed to two per patient per shift instead of as needed meaning patients were left to languish in their own body waste next slide please Tara, can you speak a little bit um, more loudly uh yes great is Thanks. this better yeah, I, I think so. Thanks. Okay, okay. I'll hold the mic closer. Um, next is the shocking bankruptcy of HCR Manor Care. Uh, in 2007, Manor Care was acquired by a private equity firm for $6.1 billion. Uh, in 2011, Manor Care's underlying real estate alone was sold for approximately $6.1 billion. Uh, and the chain was forced thereafter to pay $472 million in rent every year, plus uh, yearly increases and other um, real estate charges. Uh, in 2018, Manor Care, the second largest chain in the country, had to file for bankruptcy. Uh, and again, a quote um, of a condition at one of the facilities. Uh, one man had been dosed with so many opioids that he had to be rushed to the hospital, according to inspection reports. Um, and and. This is just really a brief background. If you want more information about the timeline, about the conditions in the facility, I highly encourage you to read the report um, for a fuller picture about um, the collapse of Skyline Healthcare and the bankruptcy of HCR Manor Care. Uh, next slide, please. So the purpose of the report, um, really the failure of federal and state governments to protect nursing home residents from bad actors uh, within the industry has raised serious questions about how governments, both state and federal, um, are evaluating potential and existing nursing home owners. And really because of these concerns, uh, we examined nursing home licensing requirements to identify uh, if there are any promising state practices um, for evaluating nursing home owners' ability to operate a facility uh, that um, meets or exceeds federal safety standards. And based on our assessment of uh, these uh, state requirements, we developed essential principles for licensing requirements, which uh, Richard will discuss in his slides. Um, and all the information um, in the report, the background of the facility, our, our findings um, of promising state practices, our uh, essential principles, it's all in the report, meaningful safeguards promising practices and recommendations for evaluating nursing home owners, and it is available now um, and for free on our website, nursinghome401.org. Next slide, please. So what role does the federal government uh, actually play in overseeing nursing home owners, and what about the states? Next slide. Um, so first, federal certification, um, and really uh, dealing with the Medicare and Medicaid programs, uh, the majority of nursing homes voluntarily participate in the Medicare and Medicaid programs to receive public funds in exchange for care, uh, the care they provide to residents. Medicare has uh, high reimbursement rate, uh, rates, which substantially factor into a nursing home's finances. Uh, and if you um, actually read uh, the MedPAC reports, um, the, the Medicare Payment Advisory Commission's reports, they, they do note that Medicare um, subsidizes the Medicaid um, rates uh, for, for the residents. Um, and while uh, any nursing home is qualified to participate, the Secretary of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services can refuse to enter uh, 
uh, renew or terminate provider agreements if a nursing home fails to substantially comply with the federal nursing home reform law. Um, and while states carry out the Medicare certification process, the federal government um, is the one that's ultimately making the final determination about a nursing home's participation. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, under the federal nursing home reform law, uh, which uh, sets out the standards for resident care, the uh, HHS secretary also has the duty to protect both resident well-being and taxpayer dollars from bad actors within the nursing home industry. Uh, despite the federal government's authority to deny owners Medicare certification, uh, really thereby essentially affecting a nursing home's financial viability, the government shows little willingness for inter industry intervention. Um, and a real prime example is in the wake of Skyline's collapse, a CMS spokesperson told NBC News that CMS is not responsible for assessing an owner's finances and stating that CMS is uh, CMS authority over nursing homes relates to compliance with health and safety requirements, not their well-being. <laughs> Next <Wow>. slide, please. <laughs> uh, given that uh, the nursing home reform law requires nursing homes uh, participating in the uh, uh, Medicare and Medicaid programs to be licensed under applicable state and local laws, States have significant power to protect residents from bad actors by imposing meaningful requirements for obtaining and maintaining um, a license and thus Medicare certification. In the absence of meaningful federal oversight um, of ownership, it is really, really essential for states to implement uh, and enforce strong requirements for nursing home licensure in order to protect residents uh, from bad actors. Next slide, please. And I do want to note here um, that improving licensing and certification requirements is just one approach. Um, it's the approach that we examined for this report, but there are additional measures that have to be taken to ensure that public funds are being used effectively and residents are receiving quality care. Um, and for example, one thing that we uh, consistently support is the implementation of a medical loss ratio in nursing homes which is a cap on administrative costs and profits um, so that more money is being directed to uh, direct resident care. And if you do want to learn more about that, uh, the MLRs, um, please, I highly encourage you to please read our issue alert, uh, medical loss ratios for nursing homes, protecting residents and public funds. And um, it, I believe that it's linked to uh, our, the, the alert on our website. Thank you. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, are there any any promising state practices for overseeing nursing home owners? Um, well, that's really the question of this report. Um, and um, so following our key highlights of the promising practices that we identified um, during our, our uh, research of state licensing requirements related to determining character and financial capacity of prospective or assisting nursing home owners. Uh, in our view, these requirements have the potential to make it more difficult for bad actors to obtain and maintain state licensure and thereby federal certification. However, um, as Richard noted, um, without meaningful enforcement, bad actors may still find a way to enter and continue to operate. Uh, nursing uh, homes within the industry. Um, and in the following slides, I'll be go over, going over um, key highlights of these promising uh, practices, and then I'll summarize the, the practices by topic. Uh, next slide, please. So first, Alabama. Um, applicants in Alabama may be denied a license if they do not have adequate resources, ability, or intent to comply with the state's health care requirements. Applicants may be denied if they have been convicted of fraud or felony relating to abuse, misappropriation of property, or financial abuse. A license may be revoked if the owner engages in activities that 
the state determines to be detrimental to the welfare of residents. And uh, lastly, a new license uh, is required when there has been a change of ownership, including the sale of the facility's title or the lease of uh, the facility's real estate. And I should mention um, that if you're looking for the citation for um, all of these uh, promising state practices and the key highlights, uh, please do look at the report. Um, it's, it's all available um, after every state in the report. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Oh, yeah. This is the state of California? Yes. Thank you. Uh, so California, um, applicants in California must submit satisfactory evidence of their reputable and responsible character. Entities <laughs> must likewise submit evidence as it relates to the members and shareholders, as well as the person in charge of the nursing home. The state must consider past patterns or practices of violating state and federal laws and regulations. Uh, and applicants uh, may be denied licensure if they have been convicted of a crime or knowingly made a false statement of fact. Next slide, please. But it's important to note here, um, according to the California Advocates for Nursing Home Reform, uh, the state is allowing nursing home owners and management companies to operate facilities without first obtaining a license. As Kaner and other organizations previously noted in comments, um, and there is a link on the slide, uh, to the state's health department, quote, once an unvetted operator takes over a nursing home, it is nearly impossible to remove the operator without exposing residents to turmoil, harm, or the possibility that the nursing home will close or be sold to another unfit operator, end quote. So CMS, is, or excuse me, uh, Kanner is advocating for the state to promulgate regulations that establish an effective prior approval process uh, for vetting applica applicants before they're allowed to purchase a facility. Uh, Kanner is also recommending that the state establish a system for public input on licensure decisions and changes of ownership, uh, like the one in Massachusetts, which we will cover shortly. Next slide, please. Mm -hmm. um, so next, Delaware, uh, applicants in Delaware must disclose any substandard surveys or the imposition of any temporary management, uh, immediate jeopardy violations, civil money penalties, or ban on admissions in the preceding five years. Applicants must disclose a list of all facilities they previously or currently manage, own, or control in the preceding five years. Applicants must also disclose any information regarding bankruptcy proceedings, civil action relating to a facility's debt, and names of facilities under state review for potential financial incapacity. Next slide, please. Illinois, uh, the inclusion of um, false or misleading information in the license application is considered a crime. Uh, and applicants must submit financial statements to provide evidence of their financial condition. Uh, applicants and licensees must include lease and management agreements, uh, incredibly important given um, you know, what we discuss uh, with HCR Manor Care and their, uh, their lease requirements um, between the nursing home owner and the real estate owner in the application. Uh, applicants must notify the state of any change within 30 days. The license cannot be transferred and automatically becomes void if the facility is sold or leased. Next slide, please. Applicants in Kansas must submit uh, information detailing the projected budget for the first 12 months of operations. Um, including evidence of access to sufficient working capital, uh, such as cash on deposit, line of credit, equity, or combination, uh, required to operate the nursing home in accordance with the budget. Uh, applicants must list each uh, current or previously owned facility in which the applicant has or had any percentage of ownership in the operations or real estate. Next slide, please. Next slide, please, Richard. Yeah, it should be up. 
Uh, there, yeah, perfect. Thank you. Uh, so David Kingsley, um, a former board member of uh, the Kansas Advocates for Better Care, has um, expressed concerns uh, uh, about requiring applicants to submit uh, the detailed budget. Um, according to Dr. Kinsley, private equity firms uh, access to vast amounts of capital means that these types of applicants will likely have no trouble meeting the requirement on their way to attract, extracting value from nursing homes. Um, so I just this really does show that even with these promising practice, um, uh, of course, issues still remain. Um, next slide, please. Um, Massachusetts. Applicants must publish notice of their intent to establish or transfer the ownership of a nursing home, which, among other information, must contain information about requesting a public hearing upon petition by any group of 10 adults and submitting written comments. The notice must be provided to ombudsmen and certain government officials. For transfers of ownership, the notice of public hearings must be given to those same individuals plus nursing home residents, representatives, and others. Applicants' responsibility and suitability is based on their criminal history, financial capacity, and history of compliance with the nursing home requirements. Applicants must submit documentation regarding uh, three years of projected uh, profit and losses with assumptions uh, of pair mix, patient days, and daily rates, and projected three years capital budget. The commissioner may order a limit or complete prohibition on new resident admissions uh, for failure to comply with these requirements. Operating a nursing home without a license is a violation of law and punishable by a fine for the first offense and a fine or up to two years imprisonment for the second offense. Next slide, please. And note here, uh, the health department has 90 days to complete its suitability uh, review for transfer of ownership licensure. Uh, the Massachusetts Health Department may extend this period by a maximum of 30 days with the consent of the applicant. However, uh, if the department fails to notify the applicant in writing of this decision within the allotted time period, the applicant is automatically deemed responsible and suitable. So the Massachusetts Advocates for Nursing and Reform manner uh, is objecting to this automatic approval, which unnecessarily and dangerously expedites the application process, adding that the time constraints should not be the determining factor of an applicant's suitability for operating a nursing home. Manor is recommending that the health department have ample time to review an applicant's or licensee's suitability, uh, especially given the importance of financial review and verification from other states. Uh, Manor is calling for the state to develop a mechanism for giving the department additional review time if needed without the possibility of automatically deeming an applicant responsible and suitable. Next slide, please. Applicants in Missouri must disclose all long-term uh, facilities they own or operate must provide a copy of management contracts, must provide a copy of any lease, sublease, rental agreements, or deeds, must disclose the name and nature of any other businesses operating on the facility's premises, must submit documentation demonstrating financial capacity to um, operate the facility, uh, and uh, applicants and licensees uh, that appear in solvent may be required to submit additional financial information. And the financial information um, that's submitted is open to inspection and can be released in any judicial or administrative proceeding brought under the federal nursing home reform law and as ordered by court. Next slide, please. Uh, New Hampshire, uh, the state uh, must deny licenses to applicants who have been convicted of a felony, fraud, exploitation, sexual assault, abuse, and neglect, or any other violent crime. The state must deny licenses to applicants if there has been a finding of assault, fraud, abuse, neglect, or exploitation. The state must deny licenses to applicants who pose a threat to the health, safety, or well-being of residents. 
um, and the nursing home uh, must submit a new application or or obtain a new or revised license before operating a facility in cases where there has been a change of ownership. Next slide, please. New Mexico. Applicants in New Mexico must provide information on the identities of all persons or businesses having either direct or indirect authority over the management or policies of the facility. Applicants must provide information regarding the identities of all persons or businesses with a direct or indirect 5% ownership interest in the facility, including profits, land, or building. Um, applicants must identify creditors who, who hold a security interest. When there is a change of ownership, applicants must disclose any direct or indirect relationship between an old licensee and the new licensee, uh, as well as uh, between any owner and operator of the new licensee. New applicants uh, must submit evidence establishing that they have sufficient resources to operate the facility for a period of six months. Next slide. Thank you. Uh, applicants must provide information uh, in New York um, and data with reference to their character, experience, competency, and standing in the community. Applicants uh, must provide information regarding their financial resources and their sources of future revenue of the facility. Applicants in New York must disclose whether any person has a direct or indirect interest in the land on which the facility sits or building in which the facility is located, uh, and must disclose whether any person has a direct or indirect interest in the mortgage, note, deed of trust, or other uh, obligation secured by the facility's real estate. Um, and applicants must disclose whether any person has a direct or indirect interest as a lessor or lessee in any lease or sublease of the facility's land or building. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, Ohio, um, applicants in Ohio must submit a statement of financial solvency that uh, demonstrates a financial ability to staff, equip, and operate the nursing home um, and demonstrate that there is sufficient capital or financial uh, reserves to cover at least four months' operation. And in Oklahoma, um, we found that the owner of the facility must be a co-applicant if he or she retains some rights in the operations of the facility. Next slide, please. Should be up. Um, I... Okay. Utah. It's, it's, yeah, perfect. Thank you. Uh, applicants must not have had a previous um, interest in any facility that has been in receivership uh, closed as a result of a settlement agreement from a decertification action or license uh, revocation or involuntarily terminated from the Medicare and Medicaid programs within the fast, past five years. Uh, applicants in Utah must also not have been convicted of patient abuse, neglect, or exploitation. In Washington, a license, uh, licensee cannot give away responsibilities over a facility so extensively that he or she no longer has responsibilities over daily operations and services. Next slide, please. And uh, lastly, Wisconsin uh, applicants in Wisconsin must disclose direct or indirect involvement in any financial uh, uh, failures that resulted in a debt consolidation, restructuring, mortgage foreclosure, bankruptcy, receivership, assignment, or closure. Applicants must provide information demonstrating that individuals directly managing a facility have the education, training, or experience to provide uh, for the health, safety, and welfare of residents. Applicants must also demonstrate uh, that they have sufficient resources to operate a facility for at least six months and uh, must be uh, determined to be fit and qualified to be a licensee. Next slide, please. So a summary of the promising practices, and we're compiling the key highlights by topic, um, starting with ownership disclosure. Uh, uh, we see that states um, require applicants uh, to disclose the identities of individuals or entities having any interest in the facility's operations or management. Applicants must also disclose current or previous interests in, in a, any other nursing home nationwide. 
um, character and fitness. Um, promising practices um, from stage show that applicants must submit information regarding their character, experience, competency, and standing in the community, um, and that this information includes criminal convictions, terminations from the Medicare and Medicaid programs, and activity, activities detrimental to nursing home residents. Uh, major contracting, we see um, among the promising practices, the applicants must submit a copy of any executed leases or subleases. Applicants must disclose the identities of any individuals or entities having an interest in the lease or sublease. Um, and applicants must also disclose uh, or provide a copy um, of any executed uh, management contracts. Applicants must demonstrate uh, that the individuals or entities managing the facilities have the competency uh, to provide for and protect residents. Next slide, please. Um, and final capac uh, financial capacity and integrity. Um, pr the promising practices uh, show that applicants must submit financial statements to demonstrate adequate resources for operating a nursing home. Applicants must disclose any ownership of a previous facility that was subject to an adverse financial proceeding. Applicants must also disclose if any uh, individuals or entities have an interest in the land on which the nursing home sits or the building in which the facility is located. Um, and any financial information, data, or records submitted, to the, uh, submitted in the course of the application process uh, uh, will be made available in legal proceedings involving the nursing home reform law. Lastly, change of ownership. We see from the promising practices that licenses cannot be transferred. Licenses become void upon a change of ownership, including when the facility's title has been sold or the facility's building or land has been leased. Nursing homes must provide notice when um, establishing or transferring ownership and the state health department may be required to conduct public hearings. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to Richard to go over the um, uh, essential principles um, um, from our report. Dara, thanks very much. Um, just to, to quickly reiterate um, uh, what some of what Dara was, was saying, uh, you know, from the very start, is that we start we did this study, we undertook it because we were concerned that um, there are, as many of you, of course, know, a lot of really crummy nursing homes out there. Um, some of them are chains, some of them are individually owned, some are for-profit, some are not for-profit. Uh, you know, we and others, of course, have looked into for-profit versus non-profit and, and those distinctions, chains versus indiv individually owned facilities. But the concern that we have, as Dara mentioned, with those, um, those corporate takeovers of facilities, uh, at the beginning is that we are seeing uh, increasingly a corporatization of the nursing home industry and uh, and that some nursing homes uh, I think historically let me say that you know nursing there, there have been plenty of nursing home owners out there who who some who did a good job but plenty who did a really poor job year in year out but what we saw with the skyline facility chain that um, is actually the owner is in New York. The the um, company is based in uh, over pizza parlor in New Jersey, and they owned facilities in states across the country at the time before they collapsed, as Dara spoke about. Um, that there were nursing home owners who were coming into the business really not just to run poorly performing facilities but to kind of suck the money out of facilities. And um, so that made our idea of, or our thought to find out, well, what can we do? How can we do a better job of identifying who would be an appropriate owner of a facility? And that is really the bottom line. And as I said at the start of the program, this is of you know, even greater concern now, even though we're, of course, dealing with COVID-19 um, and figuring out what we can do and triaging and trying to save lives at this time, uh, it really reverberates, I think, uh, you know, certainly for me, that you know, who is running these facilities? Why aren't they more prepared? Not in terms of um, personal protective equipment necessarily or ventilators, but in terms of um, you know, having staff, having staff that having sufficient staff, having staff with knowledge about 
uh, hand washing and uh, and other hygiene and other safety infection control protocols. So this kind of gets to this. It's not as specific, of course, when you talk about ownership, but it is of you know trying to figure out how you're going to get someone who is going to have some commitment to meeting the basic minimum standards, and that's why uh, you know we did all of this research, and really Dara did the did the bulk of the research. So what I'm going to do now is talk about some of the uh, you know based upon his findings, I should say, and also just some things that you know we've been talking about amongst ourselves and with others, lessons that we learned uh, by what we saw was and was not in the different state requirements. We came up with some some basic principles or foundations for government licensing requirements. As Dara said earlier on, just as a reminder, the Fed, you know, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, the federal government, takes a very hands-off approach to um, to facility licensure. Although they can um, play a larger role if they so chose, and maybe that's something we could see down the line. Uh, so here are some of the, the principles. One, in respect to application to build or to purchase a nursing home, we thought it was really important that the application should be under oath and that the submission of false or misleading information should be a penalty, a penalty, a felony, excuse me. Um, and the reason for that is, you know, people say things and they sometimes are not accurate or false and there's no repercussions. So the point here is that there has to be repercussions uh, for and there has to be accountability for what the owner or what the prospective owner is uh, saying that they're able and are going to be doing and the information that they provide to the state or the federal government perhaps. Um, so this is again is the applications. Uh, they should list every list of every licensed facility in any state or territory as Dara was mentioned before some states are doing this in which the applicant has or had any percentage of interest in the ownership in the management or the real estate, the underlying property of that facility. We really want to get at not just that who may be on the top name on the uh, ownership profile or the name of the company, but as much as possible, what is the um, you know who is connected to this facility in uh, with a, a financial interest. Uh, and just as an aside. I want to let everyone know that if you go to Nursium Compare, which I think um, most of us are familiar with, and you go and look up an individual facility, you can actually click on and see ownership information. Nursing Home um, Compare now provides information on anyone with a 5% or greater ownership interest in the facility, as well as someone who is the designated manager. One caveat, which I learned from our Amazon program director, um, Gloria Murray, is that the information is not necessarily kept up to date. Uh, CMS, I was told, they rely on the nursing homes to report that information, or perhaps the states when the states um, process it. But we saw nursing homes in our in our region, uh, our long-term care Amazon region, that had um, been, I think, for a couple of years owned by somebody else, but the old owner was still listed. So just a little heads up to that. But you can find out about ownership. It's hard to make the connections, as I said before, you know, between between nursing homes. Sometimes nursing homes that are corporately owned will have the name of the corporation tied to the name of the nursing home, and that, of course, makes it easier. But a lot of times, especially when they're multi-state companies, they may go by different names, uh, and that really differs. So sometimes it's helpful, sometimes it's not, but you can see who actually owns the facility. Financial capacity. So again, these are just these are based upon some of the things that Dara found, as well as things that we identified as important. So the department, by here we mean you know the state's Department of Health, whatever it's called, shall deny a license to any applicant who fails to demonstrate a financial capacity to operate a nursing home. So applicants must submit a detailed budget for three years of operations prepared in accordance with general accepted accounting principles. Applicants must submit evidence of access to sufficient capital required to operate the facility in accordance with the budget. So we really want to see that um, that there is some skin in the game here, but also that there is an ability to run that facility for the long term. Uh, similar to what uh, Dara found in a number of states, Applicants must disclose any financial failures directly or indirectly involving any individuals 
or entities identified in the application that resulted in bankruptcy, receivership, assignment, debt consolidation, restructuring, mortgage foreclosure, a corporate integrity agreement, which is really important, uh, sale of closure facility, etc., including the land on which the facility sits uh, or the building which it is located. So we really want to get comprehensively at who has a financial interest and if there have been uh, any issues in the past, we believe that the state should be um, looking at them, divulging them, and assessing them. Continuing with financial capacity, uh, applicants must disclose the identities of any individuals or entities having an interest in the mortgage, note, deed, or, or trust, et cetera, or any obligation of, uh, of the land, et cetera. Uh, and that gets at some of the things, with, like with the skyline issue, that they had. Um, uh, no, I'm sorry. It was it was the um, the other ownership group that they had sold the underlying property for about the same amount in which the facilities were worth. So the second biggest, if I remember correctly, uh, the second biggest nursing home chain in the country, they sold. I think it was for about 6.3 billion dollars, and then they turned around a year or two later and they sold the oper the underlying property for $6.1 billion, leaving the actual value of the nursing homes uh, as almost nothing, because it was a very large, so uh, on a per facility basis. So again, we really want to see here, and I won't go through all these financial capacity um, principles, but you will see that it is um, really important that um, the government, whether it be state or federal, take steps to ensure financial integrity. I just want to mention the last one here because I thought this was really important and we did not see this in the other states, but it's something that we've been recommending separately for a while, especially after the collapse of, of the um, um, Skyline Nursing Home, that applicants must purchase and maintain a surety bond for each facility operated in the state. The bond value must be a minimum of $1 million per 100 certified beds. Again, we saw with Skyline, we've seen with other operators that they, they, they abandon their facility, they sell their facility, and they're out, and no one has any way of having uh, any kind of, uh, of um, they don't have a leg to stand on, to be honest, in terms of accountability for what happened to residents, for what happened to staff with the Skyline facility. They hadn't paid their staff for months. They hadn't paid vendors for months. In some of those cases, as we hear too often, I remember that some of the staff were actually buying supplies for their residents before the facilities closed down. That should not be allowed to happen. And by uh, requiring bonding for nursing homes, we think that would be a really important step, both in terms of prospective ownership, but that this should be something, this is something, excuse me, that should happen um, for all nursing homes now, and we, and we strongly uh, urge a state to adopt it. Character and fitness. This has always been, frankly, the biggest issue for me because when I at least, you know, have looked at and reviewed some of the um, state's reviews of nursing home prospective owners, uh, oftentimes they're showing that they're going to make a profit. I mean, it doesn't include, of course, the um, chain I just spoke about, but the, um, quite often there is, you know, they made seven, eight hundred thousand dollars in one year. They're planning on, on, on clearing one point two million dollars in year two, about the same or more in year three, et cetera. Um, so I'm not so worried. You know, I am worried about the finances, of course, and that's important. But to me, it's really the character and competency. Some of the things that Dara, you know, spoke about and found in terms of, you know, were there, were there abuse allegations in the past that were found to have been, you know, criminal allegations, uh, where there have been criminal indictments, et cetera? Um, have there been issues where a facility has been, or the owners have been held accountable in the past? So some of the essential principles here is that the one, of course, the applicant must submit information regarding their character, their experience in the industry, their uh, competency, and their standing in the community. I think we got a lot of that from New York, actually. Um, the Department of Health shall deny a license to any applicant who has falsified any information, data, or record required by application, by the application, been convicted of any crime, including physical, sexual, mental, or verbal abuse or neglect, and been convicted of any crime involving the misappropriation of property or of financial abuse. Uh, continuing with character and competency, um, I'm sorry, let me just go back up again. I just want to make sure that I caught that. 
Okay, so we were talking about denying a license to any applicant. So in addition, a license should be denied if it was found that they permitted, aided, or abetted in the commission of any legal act against a nursing home resident, if they demonstrated an inability or willingness to fully comply with state and federal requirements, if they had any direct or indirect ownership interest in a facility that's been cited for five or more actual harm deficiencies or three or more immediate jeopardy deficiencies or their state equivalent in the past three survey cycles. Uh, we've talked about this, uh, this kind of issue a lot in the past and we surely will again in the future. Uh, we have a lot of materials on this, but reach out to us if there's something that you, know, you would like further explanation on, but we really want to get an idea of the history of the performance of these facilities in a meaningful way. So these are some of the criteria. You know, if sometimes someone has one deficiency, that's one, that may be one thing. But if you've had a series of deficiencies, especially when they've identified harm or immediate jeopardy, that should be a red flag. Um, in addition, they should be denied if the uh, prospective owner has been involuntarily terminated from Medicare and or Medicaid programs in any capacity, and if they've engaged in activities that the state determines are detrimental to the health, safety, and well-being of nursing home residents. In respect to change of ownership, here are some of the basic principles, again, that uh, we think should be in both state and federal law. Uh, licenses cannot be transferred between owners. Applicants must notify the state of their intent to acquire nursing home at least three months, 90 calendar days before the change of ownership. Applicants must, must publish notice of their intent to acquire a nursing home 90 days before the effective date of the change of ownership. The notice must include the names and addresses of any individual or entity with a prospective ownership interest in the facility. It must describe any plan changes to the facility's operations, and it must indicate that any individual may request a public hearing or submit comments to the department on the change of ownership within 21 calendar days over the licensee's notification. So we really want to get in here that there is um, the ability for the public to uh, have knowledge about what's going on and also to speak out and to contribute to their experiences with the owner or prospective owner to the, um, uh, to the decision-making process. Uh, and I think this is lastly in regards to change of ownership. A copy of the notice of change of ownership must be provided to the following every resident in the facility and, the, or, and or the resident's representative, the facility's resident and family councils where they have them, each staff member of the facility, the, both the state and the local long-term care ombudsman um, programs, members of the general court who represent the city or town where the facility is located, uh, any 501c3 nonprofit organization that advocates for nursing home residents in the city or the town where the facility is located, and a representative of the local officials of the city or town where the facility is located. So we really want people to know what's going on. This shouldn't be hidden behind closed doors. And then lastly, I'm going to talk about some additional resources that we have here. Um, as I mentioned before and Dara mentioned as well, we charted this all out for um, based upon each state, so all the information that Dara presented before, it's available in a chart so you can see and you, you can use this information. Uh, we really want people, I think this is a, uh, has the potential to be a very meaningful way, especially going forward when I, when I hope in the months and maybe years ahead, we'll be reassessing who gets to, to purchase nursing homes, who gets to provide care to people who are, uh, who need 24 hour days, seven day, uh, nursing care and monitoring, and who gets to be entrusted with that. We, I think it's clear, at least from our perspective, that we as a society need to do a better job. And so this, I hope, will provide people with the tools to, um, uh, to advocate for that in their states and in their communities. Uh, we also put together, again, as I was just talking about some of the essential principles for nursing home licensing requirements, um, those are also on a separate resource document that you can use. And uh, with that, I'm going to wrap it up. I thank you all very much for joining us today. Uh, please visit us at nursinghome411.org forward slash join or call 212-385-0355. We would especially appreciate the opportunity to connect with um, family members 
and with any residents who have um, internet at this time who can email us to whom we could send information. Uh, we are so worried that residents are uh, essentially blockaded from seeing their families and from seeing long-term care ombudsmen from even state inspections, even the Medicaid fraud control unit is not going in. Uh, we're very, very concerned about what's going on in nursing homes. And so we especially want to take this uh, as an opportunity in the days, weeks, and months ahead to connect in any way possible with a family member uh, and with a resident, and of course with uh, ombudsmen and others who are working with them. We never sell um, our, uh, our list or anything like that. It's all kept to us. We don't, uh, I think we do fundraising uh, once a year. We, we send an annual appeal. Other than that, we really don't bother people unless it's something of interest to nursing home or assisted living residents. Uh, very quickly, if you're in New York State on the right hand side of the um, screen, you can see for LTC ombudsman, if you'd like us to let your supervisor know that you took um, part in this uh, training, uh, please fill out a quick survey at www.surveymonkey.com forward slash r forward slash ltccc dash ltcop1. ltccc dash ltcop1. It's the same survey that you've taken in the past, and we'd be happy to do this for other for ombuds in other states as well. Just let us know and we can make an arrangement with you. It's a way, especially now where people aren't meeting in person, to um, uh, you know, to use these programs as training for ombudsmen and ombudsmen volunteers. Uh, as I mentioned before, we really want to connect with families and with residents, resident and family council, so please reach out to us. But if you're in New York, I especially and also welcome you to join with the Alliance of New York Family Councils. It's a great group which we are happy to support, www.anyfc.org. Uh, and then lastly, I'm going to open up to questions and comments. Our next program is May 19, 2020. Uh, the topic is understanding and advocating for residents with dementia. We will surely be doing another update on uh, coronavirus. You know, depending upon how things are, we'll dedicate a uh, good amount of time to that issue and as well as talking about um, you know, advocacy for residents with dementia. Before I turn it over for any questions, I also want to mention that we are joining with the Consumer Voice and Justice in Aging uh, for a webinar this Friday. Uh, please visit theconsumervoice.org for information on that program. If you didn't attend last week, it was really good. This week, we're going to have some guest speakers from different states talking about what's going on there. So I think it'll be really worthwhile. And of course, so many things changing every day in response to the COVID-19 pandemic that uh, I know I learned a lot from that programs, and I hope you will too. So any questions? Um, uh, Sarah, if you see any questions or if you want to, oh, okay. Um, Sarah, do you want to open up? Or Angel, do you want to say what your question is? It's star six to unmute yourself. Um, Hi. Angel? Okay, Hi, great. how are you? Okay. Thank you. Hi, Angel. Thank you, Richard. Thank you for sure. the excellent presentation. It's very thorough. Uh, 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 around, I'm, I'm interested in knowing about when my brother's nursing home, Charles Cardinal Cook, they requested a waiver and received it from the governor to be able to use the hydro, uh, hydrochloroquine, hydroxychloroquine, mm -hmm. and uh, my brother's not positive or uh, or in need, but uh, what I'm concerned about is whether or not that's automatically, uh, uh, you know, uh, used if, if necessary, or is the family consulted? I understand, for example, this morning Juan Gonzalez's mother is, is in a nursing home in Jersey. She's 92. And they were automatically, uh, they would have automatically given it to her, but because of her age, they didn't. And he asked about it, but had he not asked, he would not have found that out. So I'm just curious about that, the protocol on that, especially since it's an experimental drug. Yes. Well, Angel, thank. That's that's an excellent, excellent question. I, I met Angel, by the way, when I was doing a um, a, a a program. We developed um, we developed materials uh, for family councils. And Angel was in the family council at Terrence Cardinal Cook. And the reason why I mention that is because that, that program was really focused on dementia care and antipsychotic drugging. And the rules for, uh, in respect to, excuse me, the rules in respect to drugging or any treatment have not changed as uh, under the um, COVID-19 epidemic. So the 
state can say that nursing homes can do certain things, uh, you know, I, I, I don't have anything to say to that, to be honest. But the rule in terms of giving medications or other treatment to a resident remain the same in that the resident and or his representative or her representative have the right to be informed about any any prospective treatment, including including a drug treatment, about the um, the, the potential um, dangers of it, the potential benefits of it, alternatives to that treatment, and they have the right to say no. But what you're hearing is what I've heard as well, um, anecdotally, is that some people are finding out that their residents are being given uh, this um, uh, chloro. I forget the full thing, but the chloroquine, one that, yeah, hydroxychloroquine. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, hydroxychloroquine. Um, and so I would recommend, just as we did and continue to do regarding antipsychotic drugging, which continues to be a serious issue, is it asking your residents, you know, asking your, your, your facility, making clear, one, that you don't want this drug given, uh, but also finding out from them. And I know it's hard because I know people are having a hard time getting a hold of their a facility getting hold of someone on staff who can provide them with information. So my recommendation would be to one, clearly iterate to the facility um, by any means necessary if you do not want your resident on that drug. One and two, you know, you know, so that you can do in you know in writing by you know a phone call by email. Um, you know, as we always say with record keeping, you know, get records of wh who you sent it to or when you sent it, if you spoke to someone. Uh, and then also, I would, um, you know, if, if you're able to speak to a, a, a caregiver, and then you could find out whether, you, you know, what medications your resident is on, including, of course, that drug, but also, you know, we, we suggest checking for other drugs because we're concerned that, you know, especially now with facilities um, being even more stressed, that there's more likelihood that they're going to be throwing antipsychotic drugs or other psychotropic drugs at residents. So it's a really good and important question, Angel. Thank you. Um, Rick, we may, have I, may, yes. may I ask another question, Richard? I don't want yes, to dumb up, but it has has to do with, with nursing home investments. I understand in the in instances, uh, uh, for example, in Riverside. I've, uh, I'm not sure if it's true, but anecdotally, that someone could come in, run a nursing home for an X number of years. Let's say five years and then not take any more patients because they're really interested in, in uh, selling the property off uh, as a real estate uh, interest. Is, is there truth to that anecdote? Um, yeah, they're, 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 I mean, I, I, that's the, um, uh, it really depends upon the municipality and it depends upon, um, you know, I think even, and I'm not an expert on this to be honest, but I do remember this with, with um, Riverside, which is, for those of you exactly. who are uh, local, Riverside was a nursing home that was owned by the Archdiocese and they sold it to a private investor. And it was kind of expected at the time that that private investor, because real estate in New York is so valuable or was so valuable, it's gone down, um, that it would be, it would likely be converted into condominiums or co-ops. Um, and so that, that has lasted longer, I think, than they expected, but that was a, that was part of it. I mean, we've seen different things, that, as those of you in certainly in New York know, and 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 I'm sure elsewhere also that um, sometimes uh, an owner will take on a facility and they'll promise to provide care, and then they the facility will be torn down. I mean, we know that from even in New York, where there was one facility downtown that um, was um, was purchased, and they were supposed to run it, and then they. They wound up discharging all the residents, and next thing you know, it was sold to a private investor. So um, there are some safeguards there, but there are um, there, there there is some ability for them to um, to sell to private investors. Some of that, frankly, has changed because the market has gone down uh, in New York and elsewhere. And of course, now that we're you know amid the, the coronavirus epidemic, it's even less likely that those sales will take place. But it is something about which we should all be concerned, and it gets to the integrity and the expectations of, of nursing home, um, you know, that we have for nursing home owners. So thank you, Angel. I just thank want you. to quickly say that we have fact sheets on, um, on a lot of these things, One, of course, transfer discharge, but in regard to 
um, drugging and treatment and and rights to be involved in care planning. And those are um, free to use, free to share, uh, do whatever you want with them. Um, we're very happy for people to use them. But the fact sheets, for instance, which we developed with Angels and others, help from Gilbert, who's on the call, um, from Terrence Cardinal Cook, and from the Riverside, is where we pilot tested them for about a year and a half, um, that they are all really, we try to make them very simple, easy to use, clear, they all always include a citation to the law, so it's not just, it's not my opinion, it's really something that you can use to advocate and say these are your rights and those rights, again, have not changed as a result of COVID-19. Uh, so with that, I thank you all for joining us today. Please be safe and be careful and um, do if you have a story, you know, we, we're, unfortunately we don't have the capacity to help individuals with their cases, but if you can share with us what's going on with you, uh, anonymously or otherwise, we would really appreciate it. You could send an email to feedback at ltccc.org, or you can, uh, we have a Tell My Story campaign, which is on our website on the Action Alert page. Um, and again, we will never divulge someone's name or the name of a facility unless they give us specific um, specific permission, but it's really helpful. People, you know, are asking about cases. They're asking about what's going on with individuals, and so we would appreciate that um, very much. And of course, we are interested in your feedback as well. So please do um, provide us with feedback if you have any um, issues that you'd like us to address in future webinars or podcasts. As Eric said, we're doing uh, podcasts now. They're half-hour programs, very user-friendly and, and very interesting. Um, we welcome you to join those, uh, us for those as well. So thank you and uh, wishing you all a good and safe afternoon.